thank you very so much. Just in time, everything just in time. Yes, like uh, efficient. It's just German efficiency. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, to everybody who does not know us, I think may, many know Kevin, many know me, maybe not everybody knows both. Um, Kevin is one of the maintainers of the Java library test containers. Um, and um, I did some, uh, I implemented a closure wrapper for it because I was toying around. I needed test containers in a closure application and I was not satisfied with Java interrupt code. So um, I contacted Kevin uh, and asked him his, um, his opinion about this. Um, we'll get to that later because the test containers team is not that comfortable with um, maintaining wrappers for the library. I guess you did had some suboptimal experience with the Scala wrapper. Um, no, it's a, it's a complex topic in general, I think. Yeah, okay. But um, yeah, maybe uh, you can say two or three sentences about test containers and uh, what they are. Yes, sure. So uh, test containers is a Java library for instrumenting Docker containers and giving you an object oriented abstraction um, over Docker containers for for Java. And uh, since there's test in the name, the main use case is um, spinning up containers for your tests for your integration tests, mostly. But actually, the um, the, the potential use cases are bigger than than just testing. So that's how it started. It started as a as an extension for JUnit four, but in general now people use it as a good object oriented abstraction over Docker containers. Um, yeah, so we have it in other languages, but the main the main project is in in Java and uh, everything that can run as a Docker container, you can then use as a test container. You can specify and use any image you like. Um, we also have some special modules that implement additional features for certain technologies, like for example, for databases, we have many special container classes that then give you some quality of life APIs. You directly get a JDBC URL and so on. And uh, in addition, one of the main benefits of using test containers uh, is, I think, is on the one hand that it is kind of plug and play. It uses an environment discovery to identify which kind of Docker setup you have, because there are many different kinds of Docker setups, like on Linux, Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, Docker machine, Docker with a um, uh, Docker host environment variable, and they are all have some subtle differences. And if you maintain your own bash script for instrumenting Docker containers, um, you would maybe see that in CI, you have to have many different things to consider, etc. And test containers tries to get the pain out of this. So I think this is a big feature and big benefit of test containers. And the other one, which is also super big is that test containers has a concept of weight strategies that allows you to, um, to wait until the application in a container is ready, basically. And if any of you ever thought like, oh, I want to like just spin up a container for my integration test, I do it with bash, you will probably have run into some kind of race conditions at one point because just creating a container and starting it and then trying to interact with it, you have a guaranteed race condition. Maybe you win the race very often, but in general, the container is created nearly instantly it can take from seconds to minutes until the application in the container actually becomes ready to interact with. And test containers provides a good API to make this a stable and non-flaky experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, um, I'm currently only using test containers in a closure project because my, act, my current um, a uh, dev project, uh, I, I I tried to suggest it, but they were not that happy. Um, yeah, because they don't want to enable Docker in Docker in the CI pipeline. So the CI pipeline is already Dockerized. Um, and I guess without Docker in Docker or specifying another Docker host, Docker service to connect to your, uh, yeah, out of luck because you can't just run a Docker container in Docker without any setup, right? Uh 
you you can so you can either do um okay docker and docker you already mentioned you can also do docker wormhole pattern mm -hmm. which is the one i always used and then you mount the uh, socket from the host into your container mm -hmm. this is pretty good but in some ci environments maybe they don't want to enable it also because it is yeah. kind of an attack surface of course um and the um new docker rootless mode which i don't have that much experience with but i think this makes docker and docker more easy also yeah. okay um so bullshai is telling me there's a timeout is this already happening for other people the bitrate dropped that's unfortunate so I, yeah, we, I also have it open here. Everything looks good. Uh, okay, <laughs> then we will continue and hope for the best. Um, yeah, so um, I suggest we take a dive into the closure implementation. Uh, Kevin, you have no previous experience with closure, right? Um, I did over one Christmas holiday, I did kind of a week of some this closure Cohen stuff or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I worked through some closure cutters, but basically experience is near to zero. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then we'll start. Um, we have an Emacs window here. So can you somehow share it with me? Ah, and Zoom yes. Or something? yes, right, right, right. We will see if the build rate can handle this. I will try. Yeah, right, because in Twitch you only see the delay, right? Yes, yes, in, in Twitch is to delay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So stream um, is choppy or someone said good. stream is choppy. That's not that good. Um, so let's rearrange a little bit here. Yeah. So the screen sharing works perfectly for me now. So that's my, on good. my end, I think this is very good. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay, now you're not in the picture anymore. Ah, there you are. Oh, well. Yeah, that's life. Yeah. Okay, there you are. This is this is what we get for not testing the setup before, so I yes. think it's fair. Yes. Okay. So Kevin, you are seeing the screen. Um, the stream is seeing Kevin. And again, I apologize if the stream is choppy. Um, I should have the uh, the power and bandwidth to stream this, but my provider recently does a lot of strange things. Mm. Okay. Um, so we have three windows here in Emacs. Um, on the very left, we have um, an example application I wrote just for this session. Uh, on the upper right, we have a REPL. And uh, just to be safe, we have a terminal on the bottom right. And um, yeah, what does this application do? Maybe go quickly through it. So we require um, next JDBC, um, a pretty good JDBC library um, from uh, Sean Caulfield, which just uh, wraps JDBC in a closure way. Um, we create a data source with that. For that, we have defined the function build data source. We have the function get greeting, which gets a greeting from a database. And uh, this is just the main function. This is called when we execute the application. So um, if we just run the application, we see the main function just tries to retrieve the French greeting. Then we get an output, salut. Okay, I, I need a couple of seconds to pass the code to try yes, what, yes, what it yes. does. So, um, so functions, they 
a function call is always in a in a uh, braces yes so yes round so it's braces um, and we, then you have one argument basically or um or the get more, greeting maybe. has two so um this yeah, is a vector okay. mm -hmm. here of all the arguments yes yes um so yeah maybe uh, for the people not that familiar to closure <laughs> um so closure is basically list and sequence based and um, the first parameter in a list is always the operator or the function that is called we don't have operators so uh, the function one uh, plus accepts variable parameters so if i type plus one two that's really slow we get three okay so um we have um, on the left side uh, the build data source function. This accepts the DB config. And so here we call the data source, build data source function, and handle, hand in the DB config as a map. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, this map is um, um, the, the library uh, wants to have this map in this structure. It, um, is in the documentation how the parameters are connected, uh, are handed over. And uh, yeah, db type is PostgreSQL, db name is Postgres, user is Postgres, the password is scrap safe because it is my Postgres scrap database that I use for everything. Um, host, localhost, and port 5432. Mm. Yes, so obviously not using test containers yet. Yet, yes, right. Because this is the application. This is uh, not the test ah. code. This is okay. uh, the production, productive application that will uh, bring a lot of business value to somebody. <laughs> okay. Very good. So um, if we wanted to test this without test containers, imagine a, a bleak and sad world where test containers doesn't exist, then uh, we could not test this without either mocking away the database, which is always a pain, um, and doesn't really test everything because if the database is mocked, the interface to the database cannot be tested. And um, or we need to set up a database somewhere on which we run our integration tests. So the test code connects through to the database. Um, this would uh, require every environment in which the tests run to be uh, to have a database or to have access to a database. And um, we need enough enough users and schemas because if some tests run in parallel, then we get collisions in the database. Or we might get collisions. I mean, you could also uh, just pretend to write to the database and then just roll back the commit. Uh, I know people who do that. But either way, it's not ideal and we need infrastructure. And uh, even more important, we need a network connection to run the tests or we need a database in every environment. Um, yeah, and this is a pain that um, accompanies me for my whole 10 years in the job now, because in every project it's, ah, oh, the, the, the pipeline is failing. Why is it failing? Because the database was not there. Ah, okay, so uh, what can we do? The connection was down. Um, we updated the user. Now the database doesn't talk to the tests anymore. Um, so many reasons uh, on how this could fail. And if you have the database externally, it's really hard to keep it consistently. So yeah, test containers allows us to um, include the database in the test setup. And so we can be pretty sure that for every test run, um, the, the setup for the database is the same. And so um, yeah, you want consistency in your tests. You don't want uh, moving components in your tests. So let's have a look. Yes, a very, very good summary. I couldn't have done it better. <laughs> OK, happy to hear it. So let's go to the test code. Uh, bigger, Maybe not that big. OK, so I will move the REPL over a little bit if I can. No, I can't. Oh, I can. Okay. 
Can, so, can you quickly switch to the production code again? I want to check some one thing. Yeah, uh, let me... of course. Very good. Okay, so yes, this was the thing what I wanted to check that this get, get greeting method basically already uses dependency injection for the uh, data source. So that the data source is an argument to the yes. method, which yes. is like super important for something like test containers, or I think in general for being able to write good integration tests that yes. you um, do a dependency injection over constructors, over arguments, whatever, of the connections to your external components. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, how, how data sources are stored in closure applications. Um, this is often debated. <laughs> I have uh, read many good opinions on that. Um, because, yeah, closure is a functional language. So um, in a functional language, people are not really comfortable with um, keeping state uh, anywhere. But yeah, a JDBC connection, I, I guess we can pretty much agree that this, is, this counts as state. And um, so in a current application, until now, I'm storing it as an atom. We will uh, get to that also. So I store it, if you want to say it like this, globally. And uh, then in the test container setup, you can also manipulate the global data source and just set the connection to point to the Docker container. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure if I have found the, uh, the solution I will stick with forever in, in that regard. So, um, and because in the end, of course, you want to have it as a pooled, as a connection pool or whatever. Yes. So like reality yes. will leak through at one point or another. Yes, yes, right. That's that's also uh, always the case if you are uh, if you are trying to have a pure functional style. In the end, uh, you will have to meet reality. <laughs> I, I read that in a book somewhere. I can't attribute the author right now. So um, here we have a test using test containers and closure. In the top, we can see that we require the closure test namespace. Let me add the syntax check here real quick. Flight check mode on. So um, yeah, I'm using a tool. I already introduced it in the last stream. Uh, it's called CLJ Kondo. It's uh, inspired by Marie Kondo because it keeps your code clean. Um, and uh, this is highlighting some uh, some of my code here. So you see it's highlighted because it says, don't, please don't refer uh, all the functions from closure test in your namespace. Um, yeah, but I don't want to um, adapt my require statements uh, and what I require too often. So I just, for the moment, it's red, it's underlined red, but it's okay. So um, the main, uh, test method is this here, dev test. This is a macro that creates a test enclosure for us. And in that macro, we have uh, for every test we want to run one function call to testing. So we are testing to select a French greeting, we are testing to select a German, an English, and an unknown greeting. Um, in reality, of course, um, this is just testing if the values are present in the database. This is not a great test. Um, so if you have something like this in, the, in production, you just test what is in the database that you set up for the test. Um, this is a pretty useless test, in my opinion. But, uh, Not 100% because it's testing your SQL statement. All right, yes, that's true. <laughs> but with four parameters. <laughs> and um, here we see um, we have a let. So we store the database in this scope of these parentheses here. And we call the build data source function from our main namespace. And um, yeah, DB type, DB name, user, and password are set. And then we have a host and a port. And this I'm not setting statically. Um, and we will see why that is. Um, here, get. yes, you have a question? I, I was thinking like the, the get, so is, 
is get a, a method you implemented or like the get from the map ports or ah, is okay. it something built into closure mm. um, the get is um, get is present already if i hover over it um yeah, let's 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 try this so in closure um often you pass map data as maps mm -hmm. so um a map look like this this it's curly braces and uh, then we have um We could use a string as a key, but usually I like to use the keyword. Um, a keyword is like a, an identifier that lives in, in the application. So I could say it's, we have first name is Kevin and second name is Vitek. And this is a map we have. So um, if we get, if somebody passes us such a map, we could say, I want to get the first name from that map. And, ah, wrong order, sorry. We call get on the map. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we want the first name. Um, because this okay. is. So what code. is happening in this in this line you have there with the port? So yes. it's called get on the map consisting of map ports in the postgres? Yes. So um, let me let me explain how, where where this is coming from. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I told you, in closure we like to use maps. And uh, yes, uh, Jens is writing in the chat. Hi, by the way. Keywords and maps are closure's secret sauce. Oh, and Jens, good to see you. Hi. <laughs> so um, maybe I I try to um, explain why maps are so cool in closure. Let's imagine we have a, a function print name. Right, and we have first name, and we have last name, and then the function says print format What did I do wrong? String cannot be cast to. Ah, uh, okay. My bad. Always the parentheses. So we print Tim Teller and return nil. And ah, Bart, you'd hi. <laughs> nice to see you here. And um, so this function has a very fixed signature, right? We have a function with two parameters. Um, in Java, you might pass an, an object. And um, if we want to add another parameter, maybe h. Um, we break that function signature, right? So if I try to do this, I get an error, error the exception. Expected three parameters, but only received two. And it is incredibly hard to write backwards compatible code this way. Because every time you add another parameter, you break the signature. Um, and if I hand in all that stuff as a map, then um, I can add keys to that map. Person. Um, yeah, let's do it really quick and dirty. Sorry for that. Um, this is, by the way, another um, another way to write um, 
to get then the Then I understand what you did with the map. Postgres part there also now. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, let's let's skip the example. Sorry. So um, what I'm doing here is if we start a Postgres container with test containers, the function does not return an instance of test containers, but it returns a map, and most of the values are mapped correctly already. So let's toy around with that in the REPL a little. Um, so we have. So, but but map ports is a map in the map, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, the map return uh, has one entry with the key map ports, and in there is a map where every port is the key, and the resulting port in test containers is a value. Yes, that's logical. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I uh, little bit challenge this argument of saying it's, it's better to have these uh, methods that don't break if you add like additional arguments. So if you have a compiled language that's statically typed, then it's kind of nice if it breaks because it shows you where it breaks. But it's kind of terrible if it only breaks at runtime. So like Isn't, with... Yeah, that's what yeah. tests are for. <laughs> so no... Um, yes. You're yeah, yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, it's just, um, I think it is easier to do something backwards compatible because um, how often it's, um, I have had projects with pretty dirty Java code bases. And of course, it's, it's dirty. You can do it better. Um, but then there is a new mandatory parameter to the function or to the method. And then you have to go through. Um, years of code and see where this method is called and adapt 200 positions. And um, if it's an optional parameter, yeah, the signature is changed either way. So you could overload the method, of course. Um, different paradigms, I think. But um, yes, I believe so if, if I see it right um, in the chat, just tune in because there are a lot of more experienced closure developers than I. <laughs> No, I'm. I'm uh, also not. Not. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying against this yet. But if you have a have a uh, language that's statically compiled, or no, it's not statically compiled. That is typed. That is typed. Then the type system can help you with this. But like, what is the worst thing to do is fight the paradigm of a certain language. So yes, like, that's right. Yeah. So I did with um, with MATLAB. I sometimes had to do MATLAB programming, and there you also do this very not strictly typed kind of methods because to have them easier, extendable, and so on. But yeah. if you try to use then in MATLAB positional arguments in the functions because you want everything a little bit more neat and mm. more strongly uh, um, tangled actually, then everything becomes super painful because the compiler or anything doesn't help you with anything and then you never know which parts it is called the function and so on. You also don't write tests in MATLAB. MATLAB is not good for writing tests. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't be a sane thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I tried it once, so they kind of provide a way to write unit tests, but it's so awkward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Let's go back to the containers. Uh, although it's great discussion. Um. So we have now here the test containers. Um. Namespace um, required as TC. And um, let's just do in the REPL what I do in the code so we can uh, see how it works. So if, if you say TC create, you hand it in the map. It's um, image name postgres 22 It's um, exposed ports R5432. And and vars, it, it uh, maps with environment variables. The key is Postgres password. And the value is my PW. Let's try it. Didn't configure logging, right? So um, this is the result. This function returns a map. Um, with the key container, we can get the actual test containers instance. So this is, uh, Kevin, what you know, what you use, this is a Java object. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the exposed ports 
R5432. Um, um, maybe it would be better if I transferred the exposed ports mapping from the container here directly. Um, mm -hmm. Currently, this is just an information which ports were uh, should be exposed from the beginning. Then we have the end bars, we have the host. So um, this is returned from test containers because maybe the uh, Docker instance we are running, connecting against is not running on localhost. And uh, we didn't provide a network here. And um, so the, the host, you um, you you get this from, from test containers and then just save it in your own variable or? Yes, I just copy it mm -hmm. over in the map so okay. that you could, um, so um, let's save that thing. Uh, PSQL, um, let's save the last item of the REPL to that so we can reuse it. Um, so it's just a convenience so you can write this and get um, the entry from the map. Could, could, you, could you put a function in the map so that host instead contains the get container IP address function from the... Uh, yes, that's, yeah. that's actually really good. A good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I will. So I will change that. Yeah. Good, 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 good. good. <laughs> Already paid off. So, um, and uh, I just remembered why there are no map parts yet because I didn't start the container. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So actually, I think I wonder how you found out that host is localhost if you didn't start the container. I believe this is a default that is returned from test containers. Let's see. Let's check the oh, code. Good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the library itself. So host is container get host. So I can invoke get host on a container instance that is not started yet. Mm -hmm. um, so this is okay. Java interop code. So I'm calling the method get host on the container object. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me check what get host actually does. Let me check what it does. Yeah. So okay. normal normally you would uh, invoke get container IP address because get container IP address will return not the IP address of the container, but the IP address under which the map port will be uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so but I'm not sure one hundred percent what will return get host and if it's the same thing or not. Uh, so okay. I will check. But you can go on. I will check yes, in. Yes, of course. Extra. So um, now we have a prepared test containers instance. It knows it's a Postgres um, instance. Um, if I create that, Kevin, does it already pull the image in the background? Yeah, there are some side. <laughs> there are some side effects from in the constructor potentially, or depending on which constructor you use. Uh, mm -hmm. So this could happen, and therefore there could be already a Docker interaction from the creation of the container sometimes, yes. Okay. But, um, Which is if perfect, it's a... but might change in the future. Okay. Less side effects, I like that. Um, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so what I did next um, in the code, I, I won't do that here right now, is um, I created, I mapped a class path resource to that container. So on the resource path, there's a script init SQL that contains the database setup. And I map this into the container path docker entry point init db docs d. Because PostgreSQL will um, run all the scripts in there during startup. And so um, we always start the container with uh, yeah, initialized db that is ready. Um, I won't do this here in the REPL because I'm not sure how the resources will. Oh, let's try it. But I won't type this. I will just take this from here. And we, of course, we need to use PSQL for that. Okay, it did something. And um, so now we uh, invoked a side effect on the container instance. And um, but the function returned the same map that was created from TC create because we want to have a unified um, 
um, data format here. So um, because we won't really store the value from TC create, invoke a side effect on that, and then continue working um, with, the, uh, with the instance, but you invoke a function on that, and uh, on the result, you invoke the next function, and on the result, you invoke the next function. So we don't store um, references here. And this is why all the functions that invoke a side effect on the container uh, just return the whole map again. So we can just combine them and intertwine them. Um, yeah, so by the way, I digged into this get host thing and made yes. like a bad copy pasting. So get host is totally fine because uh, get container IP address is delegating to get host. So I think get host is the up to date API actually. So all okay, cool. cool. Great to hear. So we have a comment in the chat. Um, but with IntelliJ, we can jump from the closure code straight into the Java code to see what it does. Um, I'm pretty sure that CIDR can do this too, the REPL. But I don't know how. And uh, I, I, I guess if I look into the documentation now, <laughs> I will have a bad time. Uh, so thanks for the hint. I'll, I will have to check how this works. But I rarely do Java interop in enclosure. So I don't know from scratch right now. OK. Now we have mapped everything in there. And now we can do tc start. Now it takes a longer time because we interact with Docker. So you are underneath um, creating a generic container, yes? Yes. So which will be the wait strategy for you now in this case? I'm afraid we are using the default one. Yeah, the default one will hit uh, then the exposed port. Exactly, yes. host port wait strategy. So this is not uh, this is potentially flaky with Postgres. So this is potentially flaky? Yes, because okay. um, the um, port being reachable uh, is racy with regards to the database engine being initialized. Mm -hmm. So you would suggest using the pre-built Postgres container from test containers? Um, more or less, yes. And here mm -hmm. is uh, one of the pain points when we think about the integration with another JVM wrapper. Uh, so like with Clojure or the Scala wrapper. So what we would need to come up with is an elegant way to reuse the specific um, test containers classes in this wrapper. Yes. Um, and we I can don't actually, have an elegant answer for this. <laughs> we can actually do this because Clojure is a dynamic language. So uh -huh. um, we we can take a look at that. If um, I will speed up a little bit, and then we can take a look at um, using a generic, uh, a non-generic container. So and now here we see we have the exposed ports, we have the ENV vars, we have the host, we have the ID of the image uh, container, right, of the container, yeah. and we have the mapped ports. Because now we have started that, and um, so it is. Uh, yes, Jens, uh, right. This is this is not that hard, and we uh, actually build a function for that to integrate uh, pre-built images. And um, we build just, classes. Why do we need the map port? Because if you are testing in a cloud environment, you might not have control over which ports you can use. And um, of course, we could just assume that uh, the Docker container will map 5432 to the um, host, 5432. Um, but that would not be a good thing to do, because maybe there is already another Postgres container running on that part. And what test containers does, or Docker underneath, it takes the part 5432 from uh, the Docker container and maps it to a random part from the host. And we, um, if we um, look up the value 5432 in the map, we get that random port. And this is what we do here. And we connect to that random port with JDBC and run it. Um, OK. And of course, we want to clean up too. Let me see what happens if I type now Docker PS. It should be running, right? Yeah. 
we have um, Postgres with a Docker entry point. It was called Gifted Newton. And we have the test containers official Ryuk container. And this is so something I want to ask you about later because I did not okay. find uh, something obvious in the documentation until now. What it is? Yes. R Ryuk? Yes, I can super quickly say it. Um, we, the, the Ryuk container is a sidecar container for a resource cleanup. Okay. Um, it is responsible for deleting the containers after use. Uh, and most importantly, and that's why it was introduced, it is um, responsible for cleaning up all test containers resources after JVM exit in case there was an unexpected exit of the JVM because then ah, okay. you could not clean up from within the JVM. So if the JVM just exits or crashes, it will clean up after me anyway. Exactly. The JVM, we will uh, we have a, have a daemon thread that will send heartbeats to Ryuk. And if the heartbeats mm -hmm. stop, then um, it will clean up everything labeled with test containers, every uh, okay. Docker resource. So this is your insurance if you're running tests on AWS. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, especially in CI environments, we before had sometimes the cases that uh, um, builds got canceled and depending on the CI runner, it might actually send a sick kill to the Java process and mm -hmm. then you would have more and more containers running yes, around. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks. The kill bot, yeah. Yes, that's and of course, Ryuk, it's from uh, Desnode. So Desnode, uh, Ryuk, I don't know. Some maybe know it is an anime. Okay. I, I don't get the reference. It's not my word, but uh, I know many people watching who do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we are responsible and we stop our container again uh, on our own. So if we invoke TC stop, we again get the map. Um, the test containers instance is still there. We still get the exposed parts, the nvars, the host, uh, but there is no map part anymore because the container instance is stopped. And if we invoke Docker PS again, yeah, it's not there anymore. Ryuk is not is still there, but the Postgres is gone. Yeah, and Ryuk will go on running as long as the JVM is on now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I used a little trick here, and I used um, the function use fix fixtures. This is a part of Closure Test. Um, I can, and this is, yeah, it's a test fixture. Um, if you know what test fixtures are, it's something that should be run for every test or for a group of tests. And um, we only want to call this fixture once for all the tests in the namespace. So it will start test containers, all the tests will run, and then it will stop it again. And um, in the beginning, we will uh, store, uh, create a container, uh, this is a, a threading macro. I, I guess I need to explain how this works short. And um, we store this in an atom with reset. So we have the um, test containers instance globally available. And um, for this fixture gets passed an argument, f. So this is a function that will be called by the fixture. And f is a function that is passed. And f is the test function. So we do our, uh, our, our setup from the test containers. Then we invoke the test function because we get past the function here. We invoke it. And then we clean up and stop the test container again. We could do um, for, uh, for every here, uh, but it doesn't make sense as we're just reading. We don't manipulate state. Um, and starting the image every time takes just some seconds longer. Could you wrap this easily for the whole test suite if there is something like a test suite enclosure? Um, I believe, and this is thin ice now for me, I did a quick Google search that um, there are no global fixtures or um, overall fixtures in the default closure testing namespaces. Um, if you are using some tools like BAT test or BAT test, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, um, also a great testing tool, then you can uh, create global test hooks and uh, before hooks and after hooks. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the default closure test suite, I believe you can just set this up for each testing namespace. 
Yeah, so this is something we can we can tell to the audience if you use test containers and you have a way to have the life cycle bound to the whole test suite, that is the best way because yeah. uh, it will make the test considerably faster because you will lose the overhead of starting the containers. Um, I have um, asked around when I was creating that wrapper. Oh, Circle CI test has global fixtures. Thanks for the hint. Right. Circle CI chat. test isn't this a Circle CI CI system? No, it's it's a library. Oh. Circle CI uses okay. closure internally, too. Okay, cool. And um, this is also why Circle CI has a great closure support. Um, yeah, but um, in the beginning when I created that that wrapper, I decided that I don't want to to mess with uh, test cycle or test suites because everybody has their tooling, and I just want it to work with that tooling, but not provide anything above providing test containers access. True, there is actually a constant uh, thorn, historic thorn in the side of test containers that it originated as a JUnit 4 extension. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore it's uh, closely coupled. Some of the core classes are closely coupled with it. Therefore you always get JUnit 4 onto your class path. Although actually the, the design doesn't require it yeah. anymore. So this is something we really need to work on in the future, uh, detangling it again. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I guess you could also store the data source in an atom and use that in the tests. That's also true. You can't, could access that globally. Um, then you need to make sure that the initialization runs as the first test, first test or the first operation. That could work too without further tooling, yes. And uh, since we have Ryuk, you don't even need to have the stop at the end. You just need right. to make sure to start them before. And that's the workaround we use in Java to mm -hmm. have a static initializer where we start the containers and we never stop them. That's also cool. Yeah, then you could just initialize, uh, create the atom with the test container being initially in, that, uh, in it already. Yeah. That's a very uh, lightweight way. Oh, yes. Okay, uh, but I wanted to uh, tell you what the threading macro does, the arrow. So um, if you want to um, nest function calls, let's assume we want to know what one plus one is. Okay, it's two. And then we want to multiply that with two. That's four. And then we want to subtract 10. Yeah, somebody would say this looks like all the, um, I'm missing an English word, or like all the things people are afraid of from closure because it's just parentheses everywhere and it's really hard to read this from inside to the outside, right? So, um, and minus uh, multiply and uh, subtract, multiply and add um, are, really good readable, this could be functions with many more parameters and many more um, uh, much longer function names. Gross. So, <laughs> that's gross. What yeah. you could do, this is a macro that um, evaluates um, one expression and hence the result as the first argument of the next one. So we start with the one, then we add one, then multiply by two, and then subtract 10, and we get the same result. So you have to imagine that this, the result from this here is passed in between here as the first argument. And what, what is, is the name of this uh, macro thingy? Uh, this is a threading macro. Threading? Thre threading, thread macro? Chat, help me out. Okay. I'm really bad on terminology. <laughs> and um, so, um, thread. Th <laughs> okay, thread, threading. <laughs> Thanks, threading. Thread first macro, okay. I, th I thought it's something now like like applied functor or anything no, like no, this. Not, no, not this okay. <laughs> and um, so this makes nested function calls more readable. Um, but I read on Twitter somewhere, somebody saying, just consider, oh yes, 
uh, Matthew, thanks. Like a needle pulling the value through the code. That's a nice way to remember. <laughs> we are not Haskell, right? <laughs> and um, but I, um, what I like to do because I, I read that on Twitter and I really liked it is was uh, the phrase "let before threat." So if you need to reuse a value, consider maybe doing. Um, that's not very helpful for this, but. Um, And then you can say, okay, um, something like this. So um, sometimes it's maybe more readable if you store the intermediate uh, result in a variable um, and you have something that is actually named. Hmm. So um, hmm. I'm, I'm pretty, in general, I'm a little cautious with the threading macros. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But the existence of this threading macro is the reason why the uh, for every of those functions, the first parameter, the first argument is the containers map. Because you ah, see so here, you we get don't... automatically like a fluent builder API or style. Uh, like yes, this. yes, it's, cool. it's, it's just <laughs> fluently usable in a thread macro. And you see, we say test container start, but we don't have the argument because it's the result from this function. And um, yeah, this is a is this is an okay way to wrap away, wrap away the state from the instance. Yes, but it only works because uh, test containers already returns the instance for the methods. Yes, I'm wrapping that away, right? Else I would have okay. to um, manually handle the instance and pass it back into the map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to introduce, to take a quick look in the last 10 minutes um, on the integrating the PostgreSQL container from, from test containers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have it here already. And um, I would like to have a look at the code. This is a contribution somebody did on the GitHub. I don't remember the name right now. Wait, I, I have to look. It can't be that I can't name my contributors, our contributors. Um, this was a contribution from Rob Hanlon. And um, he took a look at the, uh, at the library and said, I can't use the pre-built test containers with it. I need those. So um, he was right. And he, uh, CLJ test containers, source test containers, core. Um, So we have, um, what we have already used is create. Creates a generic test container and sets its properties. Um, and there is init, sets the properties for a test container instance. So we have uh, split that up, the, the creation and the initialization and the start. So if we say create, we create a generic container and initialize it with the options. And where is the one? Um, but we also could, um, uh, could uh, pass, um, instead of using create, we could pass the test containers Postgres instance into the init function. Let me just pull something from the documentation because there's not much time left for error. We only have six minutes. <laughs> so um, I'm playing it safe. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this won't run here yet. Okay. How does that look? Horrible. Um, So we could say TC in it with a container PostgreSQL container with a pre-built container, um, which is not imported yet, I believe. Why aren't you starting? My REPL just killed itself, nice. 
do something else. Okay. So um, we could say TC init with the container Twelve point two. Um, okay. Uh, do you happen to know the fully qualified name? It's, no. Uh, org, uh, org test, test containers, containers. JDBC. Maybe. I think it's. No, I don't think it's containers. It was that. It was. It. Uh, give me, give me one thing. It worked. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, you're right. So and um, now we can access this as. Uh, let's start again. Container. Is this. Forgetting words here. So we have the container and we can get the object. And this is, why is this a generic container? Ah, oh, no, it's a PostgreSQL container right here. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have a, a, a PostgreSQL container specific method on hand? Yes, get, get JDBC. Uh, one second. Get, get JDBC URL, I think. Yes, get JDBC URL. Get uh, JDBC completely Small, uppercase or? No, 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 lowercase. Yeah. And then U big and then lowercase again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's correct. You can ah. only get it after the container start. Yes, yeah, so that, that's cool. That's uh, cool and kind of uh, important if this works now. Uh, so we just use the container from the last result of the REPL and we get the URL. That's cool, yes, that's cool. So of course we have to fall back onto uh, Java interop code here again, um, yeah. but we have the freedom and the flexibility to do so. And um, so we can expose the value from the pre-built images uh, and pre-built containers to the users of the library. Yeah, it's uh, so this is the challenge of the wrapper you are writing. You should duplicate as minimal code as possible, of course, and as minimal API as possible, but still I see the need to be idiomatic. So not yeah. sure, finding this trade-off is a real challenge. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. The the problem was uh, why the wrapper was created. So a uh, uh, th helpful comment uh, from Sofin, write the code in rich comments instead of the wrapper directly. Um, that's actually also a good one, yes. We'll try to uh, um, take notice of that. Thanks. So um, yeah, why? that's um, the reason why I created the, uh, the wrapper is, um, not really because I despise the Java interop API. It's um, because I was really just handling the state of the container instance all the time. And um, I tried to wrap this in a little more idiomatic way. Um, this is my first really closure library, so I'm not sure if I nailed it um, or if there's room for improvement. And um, I believe CIDR can not autocomplete on Java classes. Um, or at least not if they are loaded dynamically. No, nothing there. And yeah, um, this is a reason why I created that wrapper. I got input from uh, mainly from two contributors who are well more worse in Clojure than I am. And I'm really, really happy um, that they are there because um, they also added some things like uh, Clojure spec or um, showed me some language tricks. Um, and yeah, maybe 
use it if you like. If you have a use case for that, I would be very happy to hear from you. Um, it's on uh, Clojars and on GitHub. I guess it has around 270 downloads on Clojars right now. But this could also be one pipeline without cash, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, what's your takeaway from this? So I think the, uh, the the closure code like looks really good and readable actually after understanding how the syntax works and the integration is also really good. So I think that's how the API should look like for the user. Uh, the the challenge we we have or you have on the implementation <laughs> side is to delegate as much. Uh, to test containers as possible, like instead of pulling the keys out yourself, somehow yeah. delegating, and maybe yeah. some dynamic language tricks can help you there. And also really be sure that the wrapper stays kind of forward compatible with changes in test containers in a certain way. So this is a, the pain you have with the wrappers, that if they are too tightly coupled to the implementation, that every time there's a new version, you have to update it for whatever yes. reasons. Yeah. Uh, and I hope this can be uh, like maybe worked around with the dynamic properties of closure. Uh, and this is also the challenge, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much. Um, I will ask you some things because this is by far not feature complete yet. We have added network support in version 0 0.20. Um, wait strategies are missing entirely, I just realized. So uh, we need a way to provide those. <laughs> that people can uh, select those. And um, yeah, we're a little over time. So I, what I um, would do now is uh, thank you very much, Kevin, first for your time. It was a great talk with you and was a lot of fun for me. Thanks for oh, everybody to the stream. And I would just forward this stream now to um, Matthew Gillard because he yes. is hosting Raiding. a closure stream back to back. Um, and yeah, see you there. Bye and thank you very much. Bye bye. Have a nice weekend. Tonight I'm streaming racing. <laughs> ah, and Kevin streams racing if you are into that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>